My Christian friends, I invite you, in body or spirit, to stand and join with me in our call to worship. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors. Let not the sun go down on our anger. Let no evil talk out of our mouths. Let us put away from us all bitterness and anger. Therefore, let us be imitators of God as beloved children. Please be seated. If we claim to be sinless, then we are self-deceived and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sins before Almighty God. Merciful God, we stand in need of your forgiveness. You have given us reason to rejoice in you, and in return, we have given you reason to be displeased with us. We are quick to ask for your help, but slow to express our thanks. It is so easy for us to give you praise with our words, but not with our lives. Forgive us, Lord God, and create within us clean and grateful hearts. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a true statement, to be universally accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My Christian friends, we can believe this. It is the good news of the gospel. In the person of Jesus Christ, we stand justified, we stand sanctified, and our sins are forgiven. Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing today? All right. Um, I'm going to talk about chaos today, um, and it doesn't really fit in too much with the scripture, but we have just had VBS, so uh, I feel like that's a pretty good uh, connector right there. And uh, one of the things that we did at VBS is make this painting. I want to show everybody. All right. So we did this at Vacation Bible School this year. All right. Okay. And the way we did it was we put the canvas up against, uh, well, against something so it stood up. And then we had groups of 10 elementary students dip pom-poms, big pom-poms, into tempura paint and throw them as hard as they could at the canvas, okay? And uh, before that, though, we put down with painter's tape a cross, all right? So that was just painter's tape, okay? And so let me tell you that 10 uh, elementary students throwing paint was chaotic, okay? All right? So there is a lot of chaos going on in this, paint, in this picture. You could probably see it uh, looking at it, okay? Um, but I got to thinking, right, um, that if I had a canvas and if I put down the painter's tape to make the cross, Right, And we did have the chaos of all the kids throwing the paint. And then I removed the painter's tape. Would you be able to see the cross? No, you wouldn't. Right? Because sometimes a little chaos, sometimes a little mess, helps us to see Jesus a little bit better. Okay? And I'm thinking about that now, especially as... Um, 
school is starting back up, especially as COVID is ramping back up, it seems like, especially as it just seems like there's a lot of chaos and mess going on right now, okay? And sometimes that mess helps us to see God just a little bit better, all right? Does that make sense? All right. So will you pray with me? I'll say some things and then you repeat after me, all right? Dear God. Help us with our chaos. Help us with our mess. Help us let it point us towards you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. I say thank you to Joyce and the choir. I'm imagining, I don't know whether people uh, make the connection, and I hope you have in all of the years that uh, we have been gathering for worship, uh, but uh, uh, Joyce always makes the music fit with the, uh, the scripture of the day. Thank you. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's nice to have someone who's a liturgical professional, <laughs> who's, uh, who's ever ready to, uh, to tie in both music and word uh, for uh, the sake of our own spiritual edification. Uh, that said, I would invite us all now to come before God uh, in our prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you, not of our own merits, for we are unworthy to stand before you, but we are grateful that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have loved us and reckoned us as righteous. We pray that in this reckoned righteousness that you have blessed us with, that we can come before you seeking the inspiration of your spirit. Illumine us in heart and mind that we may have the same heart and mind that was in Jesus Christ, that we might receive your word, that we might be transformed by your word, 
that we might go forth in your word proclaiming your good news, making your love known to everyone whom we encounter, lifting up the marginalized and proclaiming a time of jubilee, a time of justice in your grace. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, uh, reading once again verse 35, which was the concluding verse of last Sunday's scripture lection, <coughs> and then a reading verses uh, 41 through 51. This, as I have said before in the last two Sundays, is, is the continuation of, of Jesus' message to the crowd of 5,000 whom he fed miraculously with the five loaves and the two fish. Most of us are familiar with that miracle story. It's, the, it's a very common miracle story. But John doesn't just give us the miracle story. In all of chapter 6, he gives us the miracle story and then all of the chaos which follows in the life of Jesus as he is trying to speak the word of God, as he's trying to be the word of God for this crowd who seem to see Jesus only as on the surface. They only see him as a miracle worker, as someone who can feed them when their stomachs are empty. And yet Jesus is trying to offer them something of an abundant life beyond just this life, a life that knows God, a life that knows the love of God, a life that knows the grace of God, a life that will reach out for others to share that same grace. And this 5,000 is having difficulty seeing that higher reality which is Jesus Christ. Here we're going to see that Jesus calls uh, this, this um, stubborn audience, if you will, of 5,000 to, to do something which is, uh, he's going to call them first to hear the lessons of what God is saying to them through his word and then he's going to share with them part of that word which will be offensive to these people. In fact, on a surface reading, these words would be offensive to us as well. Because Jesus is going to call us to eat his flesh. Listen for the word of God. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's admit it. 
Let's admit it, my Christian friends, the Gospel of John is difficult to understand. But can we blame Jesus' critics in this story when he says, I am the bread that came down from heaven? I mean, honestly, John's gospel is difficult to understand. It, you know, I, 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 I just don't know any other way to say it. It's a difficult gospel to understand because John intentionally writes it that way. Because he wants his readers to understand that there are two different ways that we can look at the person of Jesus, at least in the way John describes it. We can see Jesus as this fleshly human being standing before us. This goes all the way back to John chapter 1, verse 14, where John says, The Word became flesh and lived among us. That very Word that was with God in the beginning, that very Word that was in some kind of special relationship, interrelated with God in some mysterious, spiritual, ethereal way, that Word has become flesh. Can we just see the flesh and blood human being? Or can we see beyond the flesh and blood human being to see the Word of God? That's what's happening in John's Gospel in almost every chapter. John writes it intentionally that way to illustrate how the characters in the story only see Jesus on one level, but you and I as the readers can see something higher. We can see God at work. We can see the love of God. We can see the grace of God. So let's admit it. John's gospel can sometimes be difficult to understand. But let's clear up one misunderstanding about Jesus' critics. Here at the very start. He, it opens uh, on verse 41 by saying, Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. The, I, to me, one uh, a misunderstanding in this is that a lot of people have read John's Gospel as contributing to uh, to uh, anti-Semitism, because uh, all throughout John's Gospel he talks about how the Jews do not understand Jesus, how the Jews uh, crucified Jesus. Every character in the story is Jewish. So what is, what's going on here? Why does John say it this way? He, it's, I'm here to tell you that John simply describes it this way because for him, the term he uses the term Jew simply to refer to anyone who challenges Jesus. Jesus himself is Jewish. Every character in here is Jewish. It's not uh, so. You may ask yourself, why is he he singling out uh, just some group and calling them Jews? He is not trying to talk about an ethnicity that we are supposed to be upset with because they don't get Jesus. We can't bring our own bigotry and our anti-Semitism to bear when we read John's Gospel. That's not the intent. That's one misunderstanding that we need to put aside. Every character in the story is Jewish. When we hear Jesus say, I am the bread that came down from heaven, what do we hear? Do we take Jesus literally? When he says, I am the bread that came down from heaven, is Jesus speaking of himself as literal bread? Like whole wheat? Like pumpernickel? I know I'm being facetious, but do we read it literally like that? What do we hear when Jesus says that he has come down from heaven? That's the point we need to be paying attention to. We... We, we don't want to get fixed up in the story with regard to Jesus making the statement, I am the bread that came down from heaven, when Jesus says, I am the bread. Don't look at the fact that Jesus calls himself the bread. Look at what he says about that bread. That bread comes from heaven. That bread comes from God. That's what we need to focus on. He comes from God. He enters the world because God loves the world. His critics were confused. They said, well, this can't be uh, someone who's come down from heaven. He's just another guy just like us. We know his parents. They've been fed. 
they saw the miracle, but they don't see the sign. They know their stomachs have been filled, but they don't understand what uh, the higher reality behind it. Jesus responds to their complaining, their, uh, their confusion. Uh, he doesn't respond... How do I say this? Uh, he, he doesn't respond to the, uh, their, their complaint. He simply continues to drive his point toward the core issue, the primary, primary issue, and that is faith. He calls them to believe, but that's what he was saying earlier about doing the work of God. We talked about that last Sunday. What is the work of God? To believe in the one whom God has sent. In the verb form, uh, it's belief. Uh, the, the, the Greek word pistis, uh, we, in the noun, it means faith. In the verb form, we translate it as believe. <coughs> no matter how you want to render it, it is talking of, it, it, the, the belief it's talking about here is not giving some kind of intellectual um, assent to uh, a set of propositions. It's not that kind of believing. It is faith in that you are moving into a personal relationship with someone. To have faith in someone is to stand in relationship to them, to trust them, to love them, to embrace them spiritually. <coughs> this is what is meant by having faith in God in Jesus Christ. It's not just believing the words he says, that's one level of it, yes. But it means to engage in a relationship with him, to own him and let him own us, to be one with him as he is with us. This is the relationship that he is calling us to, to have faith in God through himself, the one who comes from heaven to make God's love known. Uh, let me uh, say uh, very quickly uh, that he's, he mentions here at the very close of this statement the idea of eating his flesh uh, and, uh, or uh, that uh, the, the, the bread that he's giving is his flesh and that we have to consume him. Um, I mean, he's not just talking. This is really, I'm sorry, my Christian friends, this is confusing material. It really is. I know it is. It frustrates me so much because I love this material. Um, uh, the, the Greek word here for uh, for flesh is just not a pretty word, either in English or in Greek. In Greek, the word is sarx. Sarx. I mean, that, how is that pretty? Sarx. It means flesh. You've heard the word in English in some form or another. Uh, the word sarx appears in words like sarcophagus, um, and uh, which oddly is not a pretty phrase either. It's a coffin or casket, right? Uh, um, but in Greek, the word sarcophagus literally means flesh eater. Um, how in the world is that uh, uh, appealing? And yet, strangely enough, that's what Jesus is saying to the crowd. As he go he's going to make it clearer in the next uh, passage that we read next week. But we are to eat his flesh. We are to be a sarcophagus. Ooh, tough stuff. Does he mean it literally? Or is he trying to focus on the higher reality that we're supposed to see beyond? Are we supposed to see Jesus as just a fleshly human being? Or are we to look at him and see God before us? It's an interesting thing to note in the, in the, the closing dialogue that Jesus has, his farewell dialogue or farewell discourse that he has with his disciples before he goes to the cross here in John's Gospel. He will say to the disciples, I, I am about to depart, I'm going to the Father. Thomas will then say, show us the Father that we might believe. And Jesus says, and this is such a fascinating statement. Jesus says, I've been with you all this time and you still don't know me. You want to know God, I'm standing right in front of you. I'm here. Believe in me. Have faith in me. Live in a relationship with me. Faith is not about ideas so much as it is about a way of life, my Christian friends. Faith is to live a certain way. It means to, uh, it means to engage actively in life. It's about doing more so than just being. 
For Jesus, for, to follow Jesus is to live by faith. It, it's to respond to God's call. It is to, to respond to God's love. Why do we respond to God's love? Why should we live by faith in Jesus Christ? Jesus, Jesus says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Do we learn from the Father? Do we hear his word? He's speaking to us through Jesus Christ. And he has been speaking, by the way, through Jesus Christ from the very beginning. God the Father has been speaking and teaching to us from the very start of creation itself. It's not, a, it's not a mistake that John's gospel begins with the phrase, in the beginning, was the word. The same phrase which begins the book of Genesis, in the beginning. In the beginning. God has been speaking to us from the beginning. In, in Genesis, God speaks and creation, and creation just jumps into existence. God says, let there be light. In Hebrew, yahi or, let there be light. Light doesn't talk back and say, no, I don't think so. So compelling is God's word that creation has no choice but to be, to come into being. So potent is God's word. So potent is that same word that in God's love for this sinful and broken world, that word becomes flesh and lives among us. God speaks to us today. He continues to speak to us today. He is teaching us from the beginning of creation and to whenever this world will come to a close. God is speaking. God is speaking. He's calling. And Jesus says that if we hear him speaking, we come to Christ. What is God saying? He loves this sinful and broken world. And I will tell you, I don't know why he loves this sinful and broken world. I haven't figured that out yet. I don't know why. I do not know why God loves me. I don't know why he loves you. I just believe that he does. I have faith that he does. And I accept that. Sometimes against my own best efforts to tell myself that I'm not lovable... God says I am. That requires me to respond to Jesus Christ. By God's love, God is unwilling to leave humanity, to leave creation abandoned, fallen as it is. God is for us, calling us to love and life. God is willing to teach love and life to humanity with his word. Jesus Christ. God is willing to enact love and life for humanity in that the word becomes flesh. God is willing to feed humanity's hunger with the bread of life, Jesus Christ. As Jesus says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He will sacrifice himself in love for us. That's the bread we eat. Faith in God, in Jesus Christ, who loves us so much he will give himself for us. My Christian friends, if we are what we eat, then let us be the people who consume God's love every day. I'll say very quickly, I, I, I don't know, some of you may remember this, I don't know, uh, Joel might not be old enough to remember it, he's too young. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that uh, when I was in high school, uh, the, uh, the federal government had a, uh, a program to try to encourage healthy eating uh, in, uh, in high schools, among high schoolers. And they had these uh, posters all throughout our cafeteria that said, you are what you eat, trying to emphasize that you needed to, to eat healthy to be a, uh, a healthy human being. And I'm here to tell you that that is not only true nutritionally, that's also true spiritually. You are what you eat. Christ offers his love for us. Are we willing to consume that love and be loved and to be lovable? 
Let Christ be part of who we truly are. Let us share in the joyous and challenging life of being the body of Christ for the world so that, so that we, too, can be bread for those who are hungry, that we might be drink for those who thirst for justice and peace, for fullness of life. Let us be able to do this because we are filled with the eternal life that is Jesus Christ, our bread of life. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. Having been called to faith by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the words that we have read in Scripture this day, may we also respond with an affirmation of our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we reaffirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, the words that we read in Scripture are often hard. And yet, the hard part really is not in our confusion, but in our inability to put our faith where it belongs. We often put our faith in worldly matters, and yet you call us to recognize there is a higher reality that is more important than just our own stomachs. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who made your love and grace known, who called us to live by peace and justice, and who showed us, who has shown us the way to go into the world and to be the manifestation of that same love. Lift us up so that we may feed on the bread of life forever. Lift us up that we may know your love always. This we pray in the name of the Christ of our faith, he who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
this time, my Christian friends, I invite you to stand as we now uh, receive a charge and benediction. I charge you to go in peace, live as free people, serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. <laughs>